I just lost $150,000 investing in a sports card startup, and I'm mad as hell, but not for the reason you think. Hello, and here we go. Welcome to another episode of The Jeff Wilson Show. Whoops, I did it again. I had another investment failure. This time, I invested $150,000 in a sports card startup called Dibs. Dibs was a fractional marketplace for buying and selling shares of sports cards. I liked the concept when I first heard it in 2020, so I wrote them a big check. But now, they've shut down their marketplace and they are pivoting to focus on a different idea. Now, I don't like losing money but I'm actually not mad about the concept failing. When I wrote the check, I knew it was a risky investment, just as all startups are. I play a high risk, high reward game. Every time I start a company or make a startup investment, I know it has a greater chance of failing than succeeding. What I'm actually mad about is that many people think failure is shameful. And last week when Dibs shut down, there were plenty of critics trying to publicly shame me by mocking my failed investment. Thinking this way is dangerous. I believe failure should be celebrated, not shamed. You should hang failures on your wall like a college diploma because you'll learn way, way more from those failures than from any college course. It's why I always say failure is tuition. No entrepreneur or startup investor ever bats 1,000 or anywhere close to it. I have made several investments that have been absolute disasters with my money being totally wiped out, but I've learned from each one, which helped me then make several successful investments that have become worth millions or tens of millions of dollars each. I think it's screwed up that people think that they should hide from their failures because I never would have had the successes if I didn't also have the failures. Shaming people who fail sends the completely wrong message. Instead, we should celebrate somebody's failures because that is what is going to make them stronger, better, and more likely to succeed next time. So Ben, I want to talk about dibs today. I want to talk about failures. I'm going to talk about the lesson that I learned from all of this. You ready to break this down? I guess. And by the way, welcome to the show. I know the audience is normally used to seeing Kelly. They are. They you're, are. You're maybe not quite as attractive, but I, I, you're, you're great at conversation just like she is. Look, the bottom line is she was so sick of your crap that she left the country for a few <laughs> weeks. So I lost the lottery and I have to be here instead. So She, she did. In fact, she's currently over in Ireland having a great time uh, visiting the Irish countryside. I think we'll see her back next week, but I'm more than happy to do today's show with you. It, it should be a good time. Obviously, I'm excited to talk about cars and dibs and, um, you know, I think we should just dive right into it. I'm particularly interested in this. Obviously, we saw dibs come onto the scene pretty hot. What did you see when you first wanted to invest in this? Like break it, break it down when you're looking at something like that. What did you look at with dibs and said, I want to put a significant amount of money in this? Yeah. So that's a great question. So first of all, this was back in 2020, right? The, the sports card market was booming and I was really intrigued by the idea of the parallel between ultra modern sports cards. So like the, the guy the you know, up and coming rookies and, and guys, you know, the new releases, obviously that kind of stuff. And, and the idea of like a stock market of cards, like the idea that cards actually would go up and down based on player performance. And it was almost like cards gave you this really kind of unique blend of fantasy sports, uh, you know, a little bit of daily fantasy, a little bit of gambling, a little bit of investing. I really like the intersection of all of those things. And that's a different, you know, there's multiple ways to approach the sports card market. Obviously, if you're long-term investing, that's not the type of thing you want to be doing at all, right? You want to be yeah. buying cards of goats and, mm -hmm. you know, cards that are, are rare and scarce and, and are, are going to hopefully have a lot of long-term value. But the flipping component, which was red hot in 2020, was all about, you know, finding the card of the next prospect or rookie that's going to break through. And then, you know, they've got a few good games and you flip it for more. That was working in 2020 and the early part of 2021. 
The challenge with the model of trying to do that within the sports card world is the actual transacting, the actual buying and selling yep. can be a slow process, Very right? So. You know, you got to, you got to buy the cards on eBay or where, whatever marketplace, they got to be shipped to you. You then, you, you, when you want to go sell them, you got to relist them, ship them again. And so I liked the concept of how can we make that process more frictionless, which oftentimes great startup ideas, great companies are built on the premise of let's take something that people are already doing and make and take the friction out of it, make it easier for people. And so I liked what Starstock was doing because they had that mentality as well. I did not invest in Starstock, but I, I, I thought that they were doing some interesting things. And then Dibs came along and Dibs took that same concept to the next level by also integrating in the fractionalization of cards, everything being digitally stored in the vault, kind of you know assigning tokens to cards and you could buy and sell tokens. I was really, really intrigued by it. I thought that there, I thought that there was a lot of potential there. Now, a lot of things have happened since then, and it, it didn't work out. So obviously, I was overly optimistic about the heat in the sports card sports card market continuing into 2021 and 2022. We saw obviously the world open back up from the pandemic. People's attention and money, especially, diverted to other things. Some of the boost that the sports card market got from people not having, you know, things to spend their money on when they're sitting at home. And also you had the stimulus checks and all that kind of stuff that helped some of the boost. And of course, a lot of that then faded away as we got into 2021, we saw the market drop. And as the market started to drop, the collectors obviously were still there. And we're still strong, but the group that exited the quickest were the flippers and concepts like star stocks and dibs appealed more to flippers than they did collectors. So unfortunately, they saw a lot of their, you know, the lot, a lot of the people who they were building the product to really appeal to were no longer making profits because the market was dropping and then they quickly peeled away and they went on to the next thing. The next thing, by the way, for a lot of those folks was NFTs back in, back in early 2021. But then that obviously, uh, or I should say, uh, actually NFTs in 2022. So they went to NFTs, NFTs boomed, of course, more recently, that hasn't, you know, been uh, nearly as hot of a market either. That crashed as well in 2022, and um, you know, Dibs actually had some association with NFTs because it, it wasn't a true NFT how they were tokenizing things, but the idea was similar that they were fractionalizing, tokenizing cards, and so I think some of that association with N NFTs also didn't help things as you know as things as the nft market then started to soften right so i think it was a, a a number of things that came together to me the investment looked very attractive in 2020 now in 2023 clearly doesn't look like an attractive idea at this moment i actually still think it has future merit but it's not right you know for the market for the market timing right now sure. um i do want to say though and this is i think a very important point they made first of all dibs is not dead they made the decision to pivot. Dibs raised a lot of money from a, from a lot of different investors, and they um, they decided you know their original business model of doing this sports card marketplace wasn't working, but they still had some cash in the bank from their investment money. So they said, "What can we pivot into that's adjacent to what we've been working on, where we could still reuse some of the technology, we could still reuse a lot of the expertise and thinking we've we've built up." So. They've now pivoted to working on what's called tokenization as a service, where they're going to try to work with large companies to help them tokenize their assets, essentially make fractional versions of their own assets and potentially have their own marketplace. It's a whole nother business model. It's not, and we don't, we're not going to go into it today. I, I, it's not, it's not a business model that I personally am as intrigued by. I got into it because of the sports card thing, but they're still going. And one thing that I think is very important is they made everybody whole. And so that's, that's, a, that's an important factor here. I just wanna make sure everybody understands nobody other than maybe the investors, depending on how this new venture works out, nobody lost money in this. They, when they decided to shut the marketplace down, they bought all of the cards back, all of the shares of cards back from everybody at fair market value. And then they are in the process now of, of refunding everybody's money, giving all the money back to them that they had in their account. So this isn't like FTX 
or Silicon Valley Bank or something like that where people can't withdraw, maybe their money's disappearing. It's nothing like that. This is a startup that is doing a pivot, but thankfully they're doing the right thing by their customers and they're, they're refunding everybody's money. So I have absolutely no regrets making that investment. It was an investment in the future of the sports card hobby. It was an investment in the advancing of technology. It wasn't the right idea at the right time. I whiffed, but I don't regret it. And I'm glad that they've made everybody whole. So one thing I want to circle back a little bit on is the fractionalization of dibs yep. and, and that model wasn't completely unique. We've seen it with some other platforms like Rally Road or, or now just Rally um, and Collectible. Did you look at any of these other companies within this landscape and, and say, I want to be specifically attached to dibs? What was that process like? And is there a reason that you weren't more involved with anything else? Talk about like the timeline and, and what goes into that. Maybe you couldn't invest in collectible or, or rally or any of those things. What, what did that look like? Yeah. So that's a great question. I really liked that concept. I still like that concept. I like rally road. I like collectible. I like what these, I, I like the idea of fractionalizing, you know, really expensive, rare assets and letting people own a, a little piece of something big. Now, there's a lot of people that think this is a terribly stupid idea. And I get it. If you're, if you're, there's a lot of collectors that are attached to the concept of like, I want to hold the card in my hands. I want to own it. I want to be able to display it. Like I want to appreciate it. And they and they aren't feeling like they can appreciate it. Uh, just a fraction of, of a card that's in somebody else's vault. I get it. I understand. But I do think the concept has merit. And I do think that there are a lot of people that believe that concept has merit. So I was intrigued by what those companies were doing. Dibs had a unique spin on it in the fact that Companies like Rally Road and Collectible are doing that with very, very high-end exclusive assets, and they're only dropping a very limited number of assets, yeah. you know, every quarter for people to, you know, invest in. Dib said, let's take that concept, but let's make it even more accessible to the everyday person. Let's do less expensive cards. Let's do ultra modern players, which you don't find nearly as much of in, you know, Rally Road. Let's do the hot rookies and the emerging prospects and you know the breakthrough stars and let's take cards that are not a million dollars and fractionalize them let's take cards that are a thousand dollars and fractionalize them so that people can buy a share for a dollar or for five dollars or for ten dollars so it to me kind of brought the concept down more to the level of the everyday you know collector investor within the sports card world so th that's why i liked the concept and, and the fact that rally and collectible did exist made me feel even more strongly about the fact that, you know, I thought, I thought dibs had an opportunity to, to carve a niche in the market, to appeal to an adjacent user group essentially, but, sure. but potentially do it in a, in a better way. One of the reasons that this is so timely is because you have gotten a little bit of backlash over dibs. And I want to talk about the response that you have to some of that, but I also want to apply it to general entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. right? Let's say that with something like dibs, it quote unquote fails by, by some people's estimation. Um, there's the backlash there, but how do you go about dealing with critics at additional steps? Like we can objectively look back at the SCI channel and look at those videos and say, compared to what we do now, they kind of stink. Yeah. You know, how do you deal with just the backlash in general, but also the different stages? And as you're building something, how do you use that to uh, adjust your roadmap moving forward? That's great. Those are great questions, right? So I have chosen to build and create in public. Like I, a lot of people don't do this, but I have chosen that, you know, everything I'm doing whether it's investing in a sports card or investing in a business like dibs, it's all out there. I'm putting it all out there for everybody to see. It's all over my YouTube channel. And by the way, despite some, you know, what has been said by a couple of people, I never delete videos. We never delete videos. If we went back and deleted videos, we trust me, I would have, you know, we, you could, you could have deleted the Will Greer comment, right? About <laughs> me saying Will Greer was a, was it's, a better investment. It's too than much Kyle of, Lever. it's too we, much of a meme at this point. We, we have to keep, we, but we don't delete videos. The only times that we have ever, the only times we've ever removed a video from the sports card investor channel, two things. First of all, if a sponsorship ends with a sponsor, mm -hmm. if, if there, if there, if a sponsor period is over, then we can, then sometimes we'll remove a sponsor video. 
Uh, and the second thing is if somebody comes after us for trademark violation, and we had, we had that happen last year, we had a major league baseball team come after us because unfortunately, because we did a, we did a series of videos and used the teams had the, had some of the team's logos and stuff. And in the videos, the team didn't like it. They came after us. We had to remove, we had to remove videos for that reason, but I have intentionally left all of our other videos up there. Mm -hmm. And trust me, there are plenty of videos where if you go back and look, like I have said something about a card or, you know, said this player or that player, or this type of thing, which, you know, three or four years later, I'm like, yeah, it was dumb. That was stupid. You know, to say, and granted, a lot of that stuff was like the clips, you know, back in 2019, back in 2020, but still you look at that a few years later and you're like, ah, that's stupid dibs. Like the video about all the reasons why I invested in dibs, which, you know, I put that video out in early 2021, how excited I was about it. I'm never gonna take that video down. That video will stay there. The videos about when I was excited about star stock and these other things, those videos will stay there. The thing is people, people, so many people get like emotional about failure. So many people like they, they want to, they want to hide from their failure. If they said something stupid a couple years ago, if they, if they made a bad card suggestion or they invested in, in a business that failed, or they just said, gave some advice that was, that wasn't that, you know, now a few years later, doesn't look right. They want to delete it. They want to run away from it. They want to back away from it. Right. They want to, they want to, they want to put skeletons in their closet and lock them away in the closet. I don't look at it that way. Like for me, failure is part of the process. I don't get emotional about failure. And if people want to point out my failures and go call up past videos and this, that, and okay. Yeah, it's there. It's all there for the world to see. It is all there. None of it's going away. It's all there for the world to see because failure is part of the process. And I disconnect failure from emotion. I don't get emotional when I fail. I don't like failing, but I recognize that failing is part of the process. And because I've had failures, I'm going to have successes. And every time I have failures, it makes me better, stronger, wiser. I'm going to have a greater chance of having a success the next time. And that's how I've always approached startups. And that's how I've always approached investing. And newsflash, I'm going to continue to have failures. Why? Because I'm going to continue to give myself at bats. I'm going to continue to make investments. I'm going to continue to start companies. And at best, only half of them are going to work. So if people want to come after me for failures, great. Guess what? They're going to have an entire litany of failures over the next 5, 10, 20 years for them to come after me for, because I'm going to keep doing it. I'm going to keep doing it time and time again. And half the things I try are going to fail. If half succeed, if even a quarter succeed, I'm doing really well. And I'm really happy. You made $150,000 investment yep. in this. You talk about failure as tuition a lot. You say that you're not upset about losing $150,000. I want to know, at what point do you think that you have gotten what you need out of this investment? You talk about, I learned from this experience. At what point, what are you looking to see to be able to say, okay, I lost $150,000 in this investment, but I learned enough to make this worth it? What does that look like? Well, that's a great question. So, I mean, first of all, let me be clear. I don't like losing money, right? Like I'm not, I'm not, I'm <laughs> sure. not. I'm not happy that sure. I lost $150,000 in this of investment. Course. I'm definitely not happy I did. Of course. But I also am not angry that I did because I realized that I took a risk, you know? And every time, obviously, you have a failure, you get learnings from it. Now, $150,000 is a pretty big failure. And I probably didn't need to invest $150,000 just to get the learnings back. I don't know that I got $150,000 worth of learnings back, per se, on this one. But... I've done a bunch of investments like this and I've seen some work and I've seen some not work. And one thing that people I think miss when it comes to investing in startups or, or starting your own company is that the upside is so much greater than the downside. The downside for me on that investment was that I would lose $150,000 and that may be what has happened now. The upside is if that company became a unicorn I could have turned my $150,000 into $10 million sure. or possibly more. Mm -hmm. 
because I was an initial investor, had a nice stake in the company right off the start. So there was a ton of upside. When you're starting your own company, the upside is so much greater than the downside. When you're investing in startups, the upside is so much greater than the downside. Now, the downside is going to happen more often than the upside, but you can have 10 failures if you have one success your success probably is going to outweigh those 10 failures. You're probably, you know, you can, you could lose $150,000 10 times and then have one of those hit for 10 or 20 million. And you just made a boatload of cash and people, people don't understand that when it comes to, you know, startup investing, when it comes to being an entrepreneur. And I know we're talking big numbers. Like I know when I say $150,000 to a lot of people, that's like, oh my God, I could never invest $150,000 into one thing. Absolutely. But the same thing applies with lower numbers too, right? If you can, if you can figure out a way to bootstrap, you know, your own entrepreneurial side venture and get it off the ground for $10,000, or maybe you can get it off the ground for just your own time and hustle, right? It may not work the first time you try or the second time you try or the third time you try, but the fourth time you try, if that one takes off and becomes very successful, maybe you can turn your $10,000 into a million dollars. I've done it and I've seen it done a whole bunch of times, right? And so for me, you know, yes, I prefer not to lose $150,000, but I am, I am disconnected from the emotion of losing that money. Sure. And that is such an important thing. And I know that's hard for people to, to uh, I know it's hard for people to disconnect from the emotion behind money. But if you are gonna be an entrepreneur, if you're going to be an investor in risky investments, like startups and that type of thing, you have to not get emotional about money. You have to see money as if it is just simply a resource that you would deploy the same way that your time is a resource that you would deploy into something. Money is a resource that you would deploy into something. You may, you may lose it. If you, if you do enough, hopefully you will eventually get a lot of it back, but you have to think of it as just chips and you're trying to deploy your chips in a very intelligent way. You're playing a game and the end goal of the game is to put your chips in enough places, diversification in enough different ideas and enough things that you're trying to start over the course of time that one of those things hits. And when it hits, it hits big. Yeah. So I'm going to throw you a little bit of a curveball curveball here. And I, I think people are probably going to be interested to hear about this. The thing that you are most known for at this point is sports card investor and market movers. Do you view those as startups that you have invested in? It's a little bit different because you are so heavily involved with the day-to-day -to -day operations of those things. Do you view those as startups that you initially invested in and... How do you sort of view the success of these companies relative to what you've put in? Yeah, that's a great question. So first of all, uh, yeah, a thousand percent. Yes. When I started Sports Card Investor and then when I decided to build the Market Movers app, mm -hmm. I did not know that either were going to be successful. I felt like they would be. Just like every every time I do a startup investment or start a company, I always feel like it will be successful, right? I hope so. <laughs> every time. My batting average is about 500. Um, I've about half the things that I've done have been failures. About half the things that I've done have been successful. I think that that's pretty good. Um, but you know, I didn't know which camp startup, you know, sports card investor or market movers was going to fall into. I was hoping they were going to fall into the successful camp. Um, but I, that's part of the reason, by the way, why I bootstrap those things as much as I could to start. I mean, if you go back and look at the early episodes of sports card investor, yep. it was literally, it was an iPad that I bought a little tripod. I own the iPad. I bought a little tripod. I bought a few lights and a microphone on Amazon. I spent a grand total of less than $100. I was doing the editing myself using iMovie on my laptop. Now I had the resources. I had the money personally that I could have gone out and hired editors and videographers from day one, but I didn't want to do that because I didn't want to be irresponsible and put a lot of money into it before I, you know, figured out, is this actually going to be a thing? Is this actually going to work or not? What so was the I moment? What was the moment where you decided, okay, we're going to double down? 
once I saw traction, so once I saw, you know, I put out the early episodes of Sports Card Investor and I started to see, you know, subscriber growth pretty quickly. I started to see, you know, any, look, anytime you, anytime you start a company or you make a investment into a startup, it is, it is a test. You have a hypothesis that what you're doing or investing in is going to be successful, but you don't actually know. So your money, your time that you're putting into it, that is, that is your test. And, and you're, you're putting that in and the public, how they respond to it, whether you're actually able to get traction, get viewers, get subscribers, get customers, whatever that looks like, that's going to ultimately dictate whether your test was successful or not. But you've got to think of it as a test. Starting a company, investing, it is always a test. And whether your theory is right or wrong will be proven out by the market. In the case of Sports Card Investor, we saw a lot of subscriber growth, a lot of people watching the episodes. It grew real rapidly in the first several months. So it, it proved my theory, the test proved my theory correct that people would want to consume that type of content if that type of content were available out on YouTube. When I started Market Movers, I used some resources from one of my other companies, uh, 352, to help get it off the ground and create the initial version. We put it out, we put it out there. We launched it in February of 2020. And I had some goals, some very modest goals for the number of people that I was hoping to sign up and pay for accounts. Uh, way, way exceeded those. So, you know, within the first, like the first week blew me out of the water, the first month blew me out of the water. So I immediately then I was like, okay, I really got something here. Now it's actually time to invest more significantly, more seriously. We hired our first two employees in April of 2020. So two months after we launched Market Movers. And it was that first few weeks of success of Market Movers that showed me the test was successful enough that I could then invest more. And that's when I went out and hired my first couple of employees. And so the, I, I wanna get into the weeds a little bit with something like that. How do you know when you hit like these specific benchmarks that you established from the beginning, how do you know when you've hit those, how much money you should be reinvesting? Yeah, so I mean, every business is a little bit different in terms of its capital constraints, right? Like, so you, you know, what if you're building a, a software product or especially a physical product, you're going to have to put more, you're going to have to commit more capital. You're going to have to put more money into that and, and put more money at risk because there's a lot of upfront cost involved in that. If you're starting a business, if you're, if you're starting a business that's content creation, which Sports Card Investor, you know, was at its, in its early stages, then you actually can do a lot more of that yourself. So that's more of a commitment of time, less a commitment of, you know, money and, and, you know, external resources like that. So part of how much you can put in really depends on the business model and depends on, on what you're trying to do. In general, it's good to be as lean as possible, right? In the early stages, it's, I'm a big, I'm a big subscriber to the lean startup theory, which is there's a the great book, lean startup came out, I think about 12 years ago. That's all about how a lot of successful startups, they really bootstrap the thing in the early stages. They, and they, and they got their concept in front of people quickly, even though it was raw. And that's like, for example, with sports card investor, how that applied there, you know, I did my first videos were so basic. I did them on my iPad. I, it was just a basic little video. If you go back and watch them today, they look horrible compared to the production quality we have today, but I didn't want to hire the team and spend the time in the early stages before I knew if there was actually an opportunity for it to be successful. I said, let me do something that's a little more raw, just a little quicker to get out. Let me put it out there into the world for people to see and let me, and let me see how they're going to react to it and see if this concept for these videos gains traction or not. And if it starts to gain traction, if I see some initial signs of traction, then I'll double down, then I'll triple down, then I'll actually put some money into it. So I think kind of stage gating the money that you're willing to put in is, is smart. You know, what the exact dollars are depends on, on the idea and, and what it takes. But I think that idea of like, let's try something a little dirty at first. If it works, let's invest and go, go heavier and heavier into this. So 
as a former journalist, the, the transparency aspect of this is really important to me. Obviously, Market Movers brings transparency to pricing data when it comes to cards. How much transparency do you think, or how much do you think the transparency of the SCI channel has impacted the sports card hobby? I think a lot of people obviously want us to, they want to be able to come to Sports Card Investor and just immediately get the answer. But do you think you having some of these bumps in the road and leaving that up there for a transparency reasons to people for people to be able to see do you think that has inherent value do you think a lot of people in the hobby have learned from the mistakes that you've made and you know even though those mistakes exist do you think that people are probably smarter collectors overall because they've gone on that journey sort of with you yeah i i certainly hope so for sure i certainly hope so and I mean, the sports card hobby, obviously how people are approaching cards today in general is a lot different than it was a few years ago. I mean, you know, when I, when, when so many people rushed back into it in 2019 and 2020, it was really, you know, the ultra modern cards that were super hot, right? It was the, you know, everyone's trying to find the next, the next Trey Young or the next Michael Porter Jr. Or, or, you know, guys like that who are, oh my God, Michael, you know, Porter Jr. Right. These guys, like everyone's chasing and throwing money into their cards and obviously, you know, there's a ton of risk in that. And people have seen the risk, you know, play out in that. And some of those players not working out. And then of course, just the overall market for ultra modern cards, especially. So now everybody's shifted, you know, oh, vintage, buy the safe, you know, buy the safe stuff, vintage stuff. For the most part, that is safer for the most part, but it's also a little dangerous to play, you know, follow the leader there a little bit as well. We have very, we have very intentionally changed our content at sports card investor, right? So we actually stopped, you know, I used to do card picks. We used to do, you know, if you, as part of, you know, paying for our services and that kind of thing, we used to do a card pick. We actually stopped doing that, the, you know, card pick of the week back in, in, uh, I think it was like October of 2020, but I saw the trend of, ah, people are relying on these picks. They're not doing their own homework. They're not, they're just rushing out and blindly buying whatever we recommend. So we switched the format of that in late 2020. We, we, we started doing an article about cards we're buying. So actual cards we're buying and why we're buying them. And we tried to make it an educational thing as opposed to a pick. And it wasn't we, necessarily investment purposes. No. People put PC items in, the, in there too. They, they did. They 100% did. And, um, you know, and then we were doing the video on YouTube for a while that I was doing with my sister about, you know, buy, sell, or hold, that type of thing, which by the way, all those cards were ones that were being suggested by the audience. So yeah, we didn't pick those by hand. No, no. So I'm like, people are like, you know, oh, Jeff said buy Ben Simmons. Yeah. Well, but that doesn't mean I was out actively buying a lot of Ben Simmons cards. Somebody had literally written in and said, what's your opinion on Ben Simmons? Would you buy, sell, or hold? Ben Simmons at, at, at this moment, right? Because that was all user generated things. And we were responding to what our, to what our people were saying, but we, we killed all of that in 2021 because when the market, to, when the market started to go down, we saw, you know, uh, geez, the market's going down. There are still a lot of new people coming into this. And those are not like just jumping on what a YouTuber says about, you know, uh, you know, this, this particular card may be hot and just blindly jumping on it without doing research, without understanding the market, without educating yourself, without understanding, you know, the, the breadth of cards and the different types of cards and the different eras of cards and long-term investing versus short-term flipping and without understanding all those dynamics, we were worried that people were going to come in and they were going to do things the wrong way. So we stopped doing all of that, like all, all the videos. And we instead shifted all of our focus in 2021 to doing educational content. And we came out with sports card university, a whole long series of videos that we did in, in late 2021 about just all about really understanding the sports card market and just giving very sound advice that help people educate themselves without giving a pick or without saying this card over that card or anything of that nature. So, you know, we're, we take that responsibility very seriously and we are very, very tempered, you know, and I still, I will still talk about certain cards and certain videos and that type of thing, but we're very tempered when we do that. You know, we are, we always encourage people to do their own research and we always make it evident 
that there is huge risk in all of this, in all of this, even the, you know, vintage cards that many people, you know, are like, oh, you know, Babe Ruth cards are super safe. There's risk in all of this because at the end of the day, this is an alternative asset. It's speculative in nature. It's not producing its own revenue like, you know, like buying stock in a company does. It's, that's a totally different thing, right? So this is speculating on the fact that there will be greater demand in the future. Yeah for these pieces of cardboard, these assets, than there is today. And so it's all about future demands, right? And that's, and that's, you never know. Now I'm very, very bullish. I believe, I still believe that the market has a strong future. I've talked at length on this podcast and on other shows about how I think Fanatic's presence is gonna really actually help bring a lot of new people into collecting, how I think the next five to 10 years are going to be really, really strong. And I do think that that will help the value, not of every single card, but I do think that that will help the overall value of scarce, desirable cards of, of, you know, great players. Like I do think it will help the value of those, but can I say for certain that's going to happen? No. Could I end up being completely wrong on that? Absolutely. Could it end up being, you know, another, another failure type thing? Absolutely. It could be. I don't know for sure, but I'm willing to take the risk on it because I believe it to be the case. I believe it to be the case, but you know, look, this is all risky. Anytime you're dealing in any of this, whether it's sports cards, whether it's startups, startup investing, it, this is, this is risky stuff and people need to educate. People need to do research. They need to do homework. They need to understand what they're getting into. And that is really what we have aimed at, at trying to bring people that education and the breadth of understanding all the different types of cards, everything out there. Right. One follow-up question that I'll have for that before we sort of wrap up the show is how important do you think it is for us to be able to pivot from something that we initially thought was doing well and then we recognize the issues that might come with it to something that is holistically beneficial to everyone? When we are, as a company, sort of on the forefront of creating content in this space, we are publishing the data tool that provides a lot of content for people. Um, a lot of places have the ability to use 2020 hindsight when we do something to be able to say, well, that's a bad idea, but often it's not been done before. So we're the ones that have to create that. How important is that when, when you're making decisions, specifically when it comes to like sports car investor and market movers? Well, so one thing that you know, one thing that we've leaned much more heavily into as well over the last couple of years is, is the collecting aspect of everything. Right. I mean, yes, we're sports card investor, but investing and collecting are so intertwined and they should forever be intertwined and interlocked. Like people should not be getting into sports cards strictly as an investment if they don't have any love or appreciation for cards or a desire to really learn about cards. Mm -hmm. Go put money elsewhere, right? Right. But if people enjoy sports, if they're intrigued by cards, if they like the history, if they like the, 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 the thrill of the chase, if they like the players, if they like the, if they like the artwork, if they have an appreciation for what's going on here, then this can be a, a fun thing to play in because it gives you the opportunity to invest, but it crosses over with collecting. And we have leaned more and more towards the collecting side of things, right? And so even from a investment standpoint, to answer your, to kind of get back to your question here, um, you know, market movers originally uh, was really targeted at investing and flipping. It was really targeted at understanding the daily price changes of cards and charts and all that kind of stuff. It still does all of that stuff. It still does all that stuff really well. But in this new version of Market Movers that we came out with last year, Market Movers X, we really wanted to make the experience for the collector great. So we put a lot of emphasis on collection tracking and being able to get your collection in there and see your collection and really nice quality images and and having a uh, you know having your ability to really use this as a tool to organize your collection Absolutely. other investments we've made in companies like stand up displays slab strong 
Those are about protecting your collection. Those aren't investment things. Stand-up displays is all about how are you going to display your collection? How are you going to, you've got these cards that you love. You're, you're, you know, you are, are buying these cards because you're, you're proud of these players. You're, you, you know, you're, you're proud of what you're collecting or, you know, so how are you going to show that to the world? How are you going to show that to your friends? How are you going to display that proudly at your off in your, you know, the desk in your office or on your bookshelf at home? So stand-up displays allows you to do that with really nice looking card stands. That is a, a collector product. Slab strong. It is a collector product because it helps protect your slabs. And if you're sh- the whole purpose, I mean, if your slabs are locked away in a vault, then you don't need slab strong. If they're just going to sit in a vault for the next 30 years, because you don't, they're, they're just an investment. But if you actually want to show your slabs to your friends, if you want to, you know, take them to card shows, or if you want to just, you know, have people over and, and show you, then, then you slab strong helps you know, someone drops the slab, prevents the thing from breaking, right? So it's a it's a collector type of product. So I think I think for us, continuing to embrace the you know the collector side of the hobby is such a such a huge thing because in the in the you know ultimately everybody, even if you are even if you are really financially if you're really approaching this from a financial mindset, everybody has a collector aspect to what they're doing right. or at least they should if they don't then they shouldn't be part of this they should they shouldn't be here right. but if they but everybody should appreciate collecting to a degree and hopefully hopefully even people who come in for flipping for investing hopefully they convert over to really appreciating the collecting aspect over over time i've seen that happen time and time and time and time and time yeah. again you know and so we've probably way over the projected time that we typically have for this. So we're going to wrap up today with a little bit of our bit segment and it has to be March Madness. Oh, we got to do March Madness. What a, what a, what a fun first uh, four days there in March Madness, huh? Yeah. Well, I mean, depends who you're talking to. Okay. Well, fun, I know. fun is relative. It is. It is relative. I know you're a big Syracuse guy. You guys aren't dancing. We're not dancing. Gators are not dancing. Neither of us got even invited to the dance. Nope. Uh, and so very, very, um, Sad ends to our seasons. Painful. But, but you know what? At least Kentucky lost, Ben. So we can share in the misery of our coworker Doug uh, that Kentucky lost. I, I like Doug losing almost as much as I like winning. Yes. So <laughs> it sort of evens out. Um, just our, our friend, our, our, our good coworker Adam, though, he, he's got he's got UConn. I know they're a, a Syracuse rival. The worst timeline. Other than Georgetown being good, I just can't imagine a worse scenario for me. It's awful. I hate this so much. <laughs> but... But it was a good. It was a good first few days. We had some great upsets. We had some great drama. We had some one seeds go down. We had a sixteen seed win. I mean, it was a lot of fun. Um, and so we're going to start with one of those big upsets. So we're going to do a little bit of word association. And where I want to get us started is Purdue. Okay. Yes, the team that lost to one of those sixteen seeds. Um, Matt Painter just down bad, right? Well, so you know the immediate reaction is just like failure, right? But but how about this? How about how about optimism? Because the last time that a 16 lost to a one, the only other time, Virginia losing, they won the national championship the next year, right? That loss to the 16 is actually kind of what rallied that team to overcome and they won a title. So maybe this is a moment for Purdue. Maybe this is the moment they need they needed. Who knows? Maybe they the, all the shame. You know, hopefully, hopefully, like as I've been saying all podcast long, they take the failure and they they learn from the failure and then they they they're not shamed by it. It makes them work even harder. It they turn it into something great like Virginia did. Hopefully, hopefully Purdue does that next season. Hasn't Virginia also been bouncing the round of sixty four in the past two years too? They have. They got their championship. <laughs> they got their championship. Yeah. And then they and then they fell off since then. They Virginia ruins my life as a Syracuse fan every year, <laughs> so I'm I'm fine watching them go down. Uh, next team we want to talk about Alabama. Oh man, I'm scared of Alabama. My word would be fear for Alabama because I am fearful as a Florida Gator fan because the Florida Gators Ben are the only team uh, ever to hold the 
the basketball national championship and the football national championship at the same time. We're the only ones who have ever done it. And that's something I want to hold on to forever, Ben. I want to be exclusive. Bama's the biggest threat to that by far. Because if Bama wins the basketball championship this year, I got a good shot at football in the fall, right? So I, I don't need Bama winning basketball national championships, Ben. So I am fearful of Bama. I am happy that Kansas got bounced because the Gators are now also one of only two teams to have won back-to-back national titles in the last 50 years. We're the last team to have won back-to-back basketball titles. Kansas could have been that this year, but they no longer are. So you're, you're reaching very selfishly. On, you're reaching on some of these, but I'll, I'll let you, I'll, whatever helps you sleep at night for some of these to, to get over Florida's recent struggles, I'll, I'll let you have them. Hey, look, I, that's all I got right now. I'm l- looking backwards in the past 15 years. <laughs> that's all I got right now. Um, the next one up is Furman. Oh, that was a thrilling game against Virginia. I mean, talk about overcoming odds. Yeah, thrilling's the word there. That was just anyone who watched. That was the, that was great because that was the first game on the first day, the first morning, the Thursday morning of the round of 64. It turned out to be possibly the best game out of all of the you know first four days of the tournament. It was that was an unbelievable comeback by Furman. Love that game. It. Uh, I mean. I almost feel bad for Tony Bennett in Virginia, but again, ruins my life on a regular basis. I think they held Syracuse to like a, it was like a school record 38 or 39 points in an entire game a few years ago. Just, just brutal. So I don't know. Tony Bennett gets what he gets, I suppose. There we go. So the the last one we're going to do, this is going to be controversial. I'm going to judge you and your entire life moving forward okay. on your thoughts on one shining moment. Oh, the song? Yeah, the song. Great, greatest sports song of all time, Ben. Okay. One shining moment is the greatest sports song of all time. There is nothing like I actually, Ben, I tear up when they play that every year at the end of the tournament that they play the song, they show all the highlights. Mm-hmm. Now, especially when the Gators are in it and have gone far and you see the Gator moments in there and the big shot and you know, you know, just like, I, 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 you have to I go back up. to find some of those. I, I got to go back a little ways. Now I tear up. It is, it is just, I love, I just love it. Like it's just so, so symbolic of March Madness and the tournament. There's no other song which ties into a sport so deeply as one shining moment ties into March Madness. I love it. And I feel like it's the perfect, cap to what I think and I think you agree is the best by far overall sporting event in all sports I know people are going to say the World Cup and we've got the World Baseball Classic going on right now and that's that's been going great for Team USA but um, as of the recording it's been going great for Team USA we'll have to see but I think Mar- Ma- March Madness by a billion best sporting event out there yeah I'm totally with you March Madness is the best sporting event of the year every year I absolutely love March Madness I I'm a basketball fan I'm a fan of college basketball but it ratchets up a hundred times when it comes to March I mean it's just that tournament is so much fun and I've got such a great tradition for you know over 15 years now got a group of, of buddies mainly from college who I've been going to Las Vegas with every year for March Madness to watch the games. And, and it's just, it's such a fun thing to do, like to experience the tournament with friends and the excitement and the thrills and the buzzer beaters and the Cinderella's, ah, uh, you can't beat March Madness. And then you're taking me and Doug next year, right? Maybe we'll see. We'll see if maybe if Syracuse and uh, Kentucky make it. All we'll right. I'm, I'm down with that. Um, but that's pretty much all we've got this time. Why don't you take us out? Yeah, great. Well, fun episode. Appreciate you filling in. For Kelly, Ben, you did. I think you did a pretty nice job. I think that was a pretty good job you did today. We'll see. I mean, Kelly's a little hit or miss. We'll see. Uh, yeah, you know, she could be hot or cold. But uh, yeah, I appreciate everybody out there watching. And certainly uh, subscribe to us on with the full length of the show. Every every week is on YouTube. Comes out every Thursday morning. It's also on uh, Spotify and on Apple Podcasts if you prefer to listen that way. Uh, and then, of course, we do clips from it on Instagram and TikTok. Mm-hmm. It's Jeff Wilson on Instagram and TikTok.